This conference will now be recorded. Okay, um, again, this is FRQ number one on packet number two. And uh, we're just gonna look at this problem and kind of break it down. For starters, we've got this string um, that I've kind of sketched in in red. There's a mass on the end of the string and it's whirling around in a horizontal circle of radius R. Um, it's, it's some height H above the ground that comes into, into play uh, at various points in the problem. Um, one of the things I like about this is it integrates other aspects of the course, specifically unit one concepts and kinematics. This is a horizontally fired projectile. So, you know, it's spinning around in a circle and uh, it's increasing its speed. And then when the string breaks, at some point it exceeds the maximum tension in the string. And uh, question A1 or, or whatever this is, uh, it asks, hey, how much time does it take to hit the ground? So, you know, the, w the way that it's drawn now, it would come out of the page towards you. Uh, but let's just imagine, you know, hey, this is a horizontally fire projectile. So when it does this, its initial uh, velocity in the y direction is equal to zero. And, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about how to solve these problems. And we can see here that the initial y component of velocity is zero. That allows us to work out the time. And we're just gonna use the variables that they gave us. So, uh, you know, delta y, which we can replace with h, which is the vertical displacement, or in this case, the height. The initial velocity here that it eventually cancels out, that's the initial y component of velocity. Uh, it's got an x velocity, but it doesn't have a y velocity. So therefore it's effectively starting from rest um, in the y direction at least, plus one half at squared a is uh, gonna be eventually replaced with g. Um, keep in mind that something interesting happens here. We get h is equal to one half at squared, and then um, I replace it with g and just solve it for time. And that's where you get uh, square root 2h over g. I'm gonna keep moving on this problem and, and have you guys ask follow-up questions to, to this as, as you see fit. The horizontal distance traveled, again, this is uh, unit one kinematics concepts. And uh, we're just, it's just distance over time, in this case, displacement over time. So if we know how much time it's in the air for, uh, and, and we know it's horizontal velocity, we can answer the range question. So that's kind of what's going on here. The thing that makes it, I think, a little challenging for some students is, is that it's um, you know, qualitative. It doesn't involve numbers. And so we're just solving it in terms of like fundamental constants. And so we can say then that delta x is equal to the initial velocity times the falling time. And everything here in red is the stuff from the part above it. So we just replace time with root two h over g. Okay, uh, part three says the speed of the object before it hits the ground. Um, there's there's kind of a couple of ways of um, approaching this problem. Notice, you know, here this statement v x doesn't change, but when it hits the ground, v y has changed. V y was initially zero, uh, but but then this is just a kinematics equation. What I bo boxed in in here. This is the second kinematics equation, V final equals V initial plus acceleration times time. So the acceleration is G and the time is 2H over G. So we just kind of plug those numbers in. Notice that V initial in the Y direction is zero. So it just kind of goes away. And uh, this all reduces to root two uh, G H. Um, it's a little obnoxious. So, you know, the, if you could get here, but, but not here, that's okay. Um, I think that, that that's acceptable if you just left it as G times root 2H over G. This is just kind of advanced algebra um, in order to simplify that down to root 2GH. And then, and then this is just a Pythagorean theorem, right? When it hits the ground, based on the sketch that I had drawn, is doing something like this. So right before hitting the ground, it's got an X component of velocity. It's got a Y component of velocity. We know that um, we're gonna add them together. They make a right triangle. Uh, and they're asking about the speed. So, so speed does not have a direction. We don't have to answer the theta question. We're just gonna use right triangle tr uh, trigonometry 
where we um, are basically finding the hypotenuse when this side, which is kind of VY, and this side, uh, which is VX, both of those are known. And that's where this comes from. So we're saying, okay, the speed that we're looking for, you know, this is basically saying C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. Then we just take the square root of both sides, that gets rid of that, and we have this expression for speed, and we're good to go. Again, getting this reduced properly is just some algebra. Um, I tried to make some explanations kind of over here, but, um, you know, follow it along if you can, and if you can't, uh, I wouldn't spend my time worrying about that stuff. Let's take a look at uh, part B, which is the first time that UCM comes into play. So part A is really just all kinematics questions. Um, so, so this question says, on the figure, draw and label the forces acting. Here's our free body diagram. Um, if I were to draw this in component form, again, this is exactly the type of question that you sh you would be asked where you're not supposed to draw it in component form. So this is, you know, this is drawn correctly. You would get a deduction if you showed this, but you know, just just for edification, um, you know, FTY and FTX, right? Those are the components of the tension vector when I show them kind of in component form. Of course, there's a weight vector, MG acting down. These two guys cancel out. We know that because it's not a, uh, accelerated vertically. Um, it is accelerated horizontally. There's only one force in this in this case it's the component the x component or the horizontal component of the tension force that's directed radially inward towards the center of the circle so we're going to ultimately you know from that free body diagram in part c make this statement where the x component of tension is the centripetal force that's basically the beginning of our dynamics equation in part c all right so i'm going to assume that most of the questions when you originally asked on this are here in part C. Um, part A was kinematics, part B is a free body diagram that I think most of you would be comfortable with, but if not, uh, please ask a question. Um, and then part C is really where the kind of meat and potatoes for this problem is. Um, notice that I've shown the, um, the, the kind of vector uh, resolution into components in part C, but I wouldn't dare put that in part B, right? So, so this would definitely be a deduction if I if I'd done that up here. So this is just, you know, here for me. And so now I can say that the X component of the tension force, as we discussed, um, which can be written as T cosine theta, right? I'm resolving that into its X component is equal to MV squared over R. Um, and now I'm solving this for T. So, so the question is, what is the tension? Not they didn't ask what's the X component of the tension. They asked what's the, the unresolved, what's the tension in the string? So that's it. I mean, that's really all I'm doing. I'm solving this for T uh, and I, I can, you know, um, divide both sides by cosine theta. So, so I suppose that you could just say that T is equal to MV naught squared over R uh, divided by cosine theta. That's kind of one approach to doing this. The problem is that when you read the the question, you know, that's that's what I would have done. But in this question, they say, hey, man, we don't want it in terms of theta. Uh, so, so I'm kind of stuck here. Um, I got to be really honest. I mean, we're going to go through this. Um, but I'd say this last part is definitely a stretch. Uh, and, you know, it's not undoable, but this last kind of part is a little tricky because, you know, it's not, I don't think it's difficult conceptually. At the end of the day, if you get this, you're in great shape. The rest of this is just fancy math and substitution. And we're going to, let's, let's do it. So we get um, the tension is equal to the X component of tension plus the Y component of tension. Here's another Pythagorean theorem statement here next to the asterisk, um, where Tx via this dynamics equation that I wrote is equal to mv squared over r. So that's what this is saying. It's saying, okay, let's take the x component of tension uh, and square it plus mg, the y component of tension we said uh, was equal to the weight vector mg. So, so Ty is mg squared. 
So if you didn't get this problem right, but you're looking at this step here that I've kind of boxed in in pink, man, you're in great shape. Like you, you were able to get the problem started. And then, and then from here through here to get, to kind of get to the end is just algebra. It really is. And, and, you know, if you got, if you got roasted on that problem and were like, man, I don't know how to get to that answer. Like that really, that, that algebra part, um, shouldn't it, it i mean I, I understand that you guys want to when you're solving problems like this you're definitely satisfied with 100 percent. you're satisfied when you know you get the answer that's on the bottom of the answer key this question comes from the old ap physics b uh test which uh predates physics one by about six years and um they would include these types of questions because back then ap physics b was a second year physics class. So they would make the questions, you know, they they were definitely up a, a little bit. AP Physics 1 was, you know, it's designed to be a first year physics class. And for that reason, you know, it's highly unlikely to see something requiring you to navigate through this kind of algebra. So, um, you know, Dylan, I don't know if that's satisfactory when you kind of see that solution. Um, and we could easily spend 10 minutes here kind of sorting out the algebra. My point is, you know, if you get to this point, you're in great shape, uh, and I'd call it, uh, I'd call it a night. If there are follow-up questions on FRQ number one, please let me know. Emily's got a question on packet one, question number four. So I'm going to queue that up. Hey, can you guys confirm real quick that the screen changed to packet number one? I did this one time where I went off on a problem and uh, and everybody was like, we were looking at the wrong packet. So I wanna make sure we're looking at the right thing here. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at question number four. This falls into um, this category of problem. We've been working on them in class, and we say that uh, we call we call these qualitative problems. And they're asking you about the person's weight. So for starters, it recognize it, it requires you to solve this problem correctly. It requires you to recognize that weight is the same thing as the force due to gravity. Now, often we'll refer to this as also as mg. We'll use these words interchangeably, weight, mg, but for the force of gravity. And the force of gravity in its most fundamental state is this universal law, right? Uh, Fg is equal to big G times uh, m1, m2 over r squared. This in the box that I just sketched is on your yellow equation sheet, so it's considered fundamental where G is the Cavendish constant found by the torsion bar. That's that you know, really, really small number, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. It's called big G and it's the uh, universal gravitational constant. It's got funky units, Newton meters squared over kilogram, uh, over kilogram squared. But don't let the units here that I've just bracketed in, don't, don't let them intimidate you. They're just, they're just units. And uh, ultimately they kind of cancel out the square meters in the numerator. Uh, I'm sorry, the square kilograms in the numerator and the square meters in the denominator, and you're just left with Newtons. All right, so this question's saying, hey man, a person weighs 800 Newtons on Earth, and now they go to this different planet, and it has twice the mass and twice the radius. What's the person's weight on the other planet? So it's a question about the force of gravity. I'm going to show you two methods to solve a problem like this. Uh, method number one I'm going to do here in blue. This is the one I recommend. It's not that the other one... I don't recommend it. I just think this is the fastest and the clearest way, but, but other purists will prefer a different method, uh, I think, when I show it to you. So we're going to say um, Fg is equal to, you know, as I've said, G times the mass of the planet times the mass of the thing over the separating distance squared. So here's the thing. When, when the person goes to a different planet, the, the mass of the thing right here, that doesn't change when I go from Earth to another planet. That's the same thing. And I could say the same thing about the universal gravitational constant, big G, that really small number. Uh, it doesn't matter where I am, that number is the same. 
So I can rewrite this and just say that FG is proportional to M uh, of the planet over R squared, the separating distance between the thing and the center of the planet, which is basically the radius of the planet. So because I removed M and big G, I can't have an equal sign anymore. This, this no longer is gonna give me the right kind of uh, numerical answer, the, the, the right unit analysis. Uh, my units here, by the way, are gonna be kilograms over square meters, which is funky. So it's not gonna give me, but it is proportional to it. So, so here's, what, here's what we do. Once we get rid of all the stuff and we kind of get down to this rectangle, then my recommendation is to change you know, to set everything equal to one. So on earth, uh, I have one over one squared, uh, which is obviously equal to one. So, so on earth, this, this kind of multiplication factor is one. And now I go to this planet and I'm gonna change this. The, the mass of the planet, they told us in question number uh, four, they told us that it's twice the mass. So if I do this again, I get two, but it also has twice the radius, two over two squared. Well, that's two over four or one half. So the force of gravity on this new planet is gonna be half of what it is on Earth. So if I weigh 800 Newtons on Earth, I'm gonna weigh 400 Newtons on this other planet. And that's uh, how you would approach a question like that. Okay, so now that I've done that, I wanna do it a second time. Um, except, except this way, uh, this, this kind of, this, this other way is going to be a little, a little more complex and a little more time consuming, I think, but, but that's all right. Let's just do it to kind of show it to you. Um, let's see what kind of free space I can get. Uh, there's not a lot of place, but I'll use this spot up here. Okay. So, um, here's what we can do. We can say that, that the force of gravity on, um, on this new planet, uh, let's call it um, let's call it X, and I'm going to set that up as a ratio to the force of gravity on Earth, and that's going to be equal to G times the mass of planet X times the mass of the thing over the radius of planet X squared, and I'm going to divide that all by uh, again G times the mass of the planet Earth times uh, the mass of the thing over the radius of Earth squared. So I've just set this up as this kind of huge fraction, right? So, so I'm, this is kind of like a proportion problem. And, and, and then ultimately I'm gonna say, okay, all of this is equal to 800 Newtons. We wanna know what X is, which is the force of gravity on planet X. So when we do it this way, we can see that G doesn't matter. We can see that mass of the thing doesn't matter. Now, this boils down to mass of planet X over radius of X squared divided by mass of planet Earth over radius of Earth squared. This is a complex fraction. I have a, a fraction over a fraction, so I'm gonna multiply by the reciprocal. So, so ultimately, Let's get rid of this. I'm gonna multiply by the radius of Earth squared. And I'm gonna divide it by the mass of the planet Earth, right? I'm multiplying by the reciprocal of what was in my denominator. So here's where it gets a little interesting. Then I'm gonna do this one last step uh, here. I'm gonna replace mass of planet X with two times the mass of planet Earth. Right, because that's what that's what they told me what it was. Then they also told me that that the radius of planet X was two times the radius of planet Earth. I got to remember that that's getting squared, and that's getting multiplied by right. I'm, I'm I don't want to forget everything on the right hand side. The radius of Earth squared divided by the mass of Earth. Well, we can see the masses of the Earth cancel out, and eventually the radius of the Earth is going to cancel out. This in the denominator becomes four times the radius of Earth squared, right? So the, the radius of Earth squared cancels out and I get two over four, um, you know, when, when, 
when everything here is replaced. So I get two over four or one half. So, so one half is equal to X over 800 Newtons. And so now I can solve this for X, you know, and I can cross multiply. And I think that you can see in this case that X is equal to 400 Newtons after I do that. All right, so some people are gonna look at that and be like, bro, that was just way too much work. Why would I wanna do that? That's just more of a kind of purist approach. All right, hopefully I didn't burn through too much time just kind of showing that. But um, if you have additional questions, I wanna bring up, um, bear with me, I just wanna bring up um, the Unified Classroom page. And, and the reason I wanna do that is um, so that you can see where there are some kind of extra problems. So I'm gonna flip screens so that you're looking at my browser. Okay, hopefully you're looking now at the AP Physics One page. And I just went to page 3.2. And when you're on 3.2, there are some additional problems right here um, that I think, you know, I've had some people come in and check in with me on these kinds of problems. I think this would be a great place for you to get some extra practice um, if you're really struggling with these kind of qualitative problems. And, um, you know, the good thing is there, the solutions for them are all worked out um, further down on the page. So uh, right here on assignment 3.2, you can kind of see that all those are worked out so you could you could um, kind of mess around get some extra practice in okay um, let's get back to uh, the queue and um, uh, one of the questions was do we have to have the mass and radius of the earth memorized the answer is no um, I have made a mistake in class where I assumed that the mass of the earth and the radius of the earth were fundamental constants given to you on, on your equation sheets, they are not. Uh, so if you were given a question that required you to know it, you would it would it would be given to you in the problem. So the answer to Nicole's question about memorizing mass and radius of the earth, you don't need to know it. Um, okay, uh, let's see how we're doing here. So we, we looked at, and Emily, by the way, make sure I've answered your question on number four on packet number one. If you have follow-up questions, please ask them. Um, Alyssa is asking packet two, question number six. Um, so let's go back to the packet. All right, so here we are. Um, so question number six is this uh, hypothetical planet um, orbiting a star with a with mass one half that of our sun. The planet's orbital radius is the same as Earth's. How many Earth years does it take for the planet to complete one orbit? Um, there's a couple things on this question that should kind of give you a cue. And that is they're asking you about time. And as soon as they ask you about time, 99% of the time, what that means is you're going to have to make some substitution in for speed somewhere where speed is distance over time for circular motion it's circumference over period because how far do you go in in a circular path that we call that the circumference the distance around the circle and the orbital period which we abbreviate with a capital t is the amount of time that it takes to complete one of these rotations so that would be then two pi r over the period so somewhere in this problem we are going to use uh, this substitution where speed is equal to two pi r over period. And then we're gonna solve it for period, the amount of time that it takes something to happen. Okay, so you know what's next? Well, on, on these gravitation, on, you know, another cue by the way, is that we've got the word orbit in there. And for anything that's uh, in orbit, then we would say that the gravitational force is the centripetal force. There are no other forces that I know of that put things that 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 pull towards the center of a circle when things are in orbit. I, I guess 
you know, you could use that word that the word orbit more liberally and just say, hey, uh, the tether ball is in orbit around the pole. And in that case, tension would be the center seeking force. But when when planetary systems, we get FG is equal to FC. And then um, we can see that the gravitational constant G mass of the planet, mass of the thing over the separating distance squared is equal to mass of the thing times V squared over R. OK, based on what we talked about earlier, at some point, we're going to have to substitute in for V squared. Um, before we do that, um, let's go ahead and kind of make a few uh, adjustments to this. We can see that the mass of the orbiting thing doesn't matter. The mass of the, the, the thing in the center of the orbit, typically the, the sun or the planet or whatever it is that's pulling the satellite around in an orbit, and by the way, we Earth is a satellite of the sun, right? So uh, in this case, this would be the mass of the sun, but uh, one of the R's in the denominator on the left cancels out with the one R on the denominator on the right, and I'm left with this expression, V squared is equal to G times the mass of the planet over the radius. If I stop there and just solve it for V, by the way, this is called the satellite equation. And if you ever see the word satellite, uh, in uh, kind of a multiple choice problem, you should say, all right, well, you know, the satellite equation is V is equal to the square root G mass of the planet um, over R, right? Because I just take the square root of both sides. This question, um, I, I suppose I suppose we could just start with that. Why not? And then uh, we'll substitute in for V. Uh, we're going to get 2 pi R over period. Um, you know, when I say why not, I think the way I would have solved this is I wouldn't have done this in green. Uh, I'll come back to this in a sec. I would have continued on and I would have just said, okay, on the left-hand side, I have G mass of the planet over uh, the separating distance. And on the right-hand side, I get four pi squared uh, R squared over period squared, right? So. So I have to solve this for period. And the reason I like it in green, uh, sorry, the reason I like the, the path that I took in blue versus doing it in green is, hey man, I got this square root sign I'm gonna have to deal with and it just gets kind of ugly. People are generally, at least I am, less, less comfortable with um, adding and multiplying things under square root symbols than I am uh, with exponents. So I, I prefer to do this until the very, you know, taking the square root at the very end. Um, I'm gonna solve this for for t squared. So I'm going to continue my work up here. So I'm going to multiply both sides by t squared. Um, and, that, and that is now on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I get 4 pi squared. And I'm going to multiply both sides by r. That gives me r cubed, right? Because when I multiply both sides by r, that gets rid of the one on the r on the left. And that gives me a new r on the right-hand side. So I get r cubed. And then I'm dividing it by g mass of the planet. So, you know, what's important here, uh, this next step is, is you know, kind of critical. What's important uh, for, to kind of figure out what the period is, four and pi are just constants, like they're not changing. Um, and uh, I'm trying to figure out which problem, we're doing number six. Okay, they want, we're solving this for time and it, um, the 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 star which 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 is mass at the planet in this case because it's the planet that's orbiting the star um, is one half the mass of the sun so we can see that period squared is proportional to right because I'm going to leave off uh, g I'm definitely going to leave off g that's that's not changing a uh, four pi isn't changing so we can say that t squared is proportional to r cubed over mass of the planet or I can take the square root of both sides and I get that right well the orbital radius in question number six is the same as earth's so that just becomes you know again my advice is once you get it down to here make everything just a one for earth that becomes this uh you know square root of one cubed which is just one over the square root of one which is just one so that gives us one if I do it again except you know, let me do it in a different color. Uh, now I do it for this new planet. Uh, the radius 
is still one, right? It's the same orbital radius. So my numerator is going to be one. And the mass of the planet is going to be uh, twice that of Earth's mass. Uh, and so we can see that that's going to be one over root two um, is equal to uh, p the, the kind of uh, new proportional um, expression. I should keep this here like this. Um, so, so if this becomes, you know, um, if I set it up, if I set it up as a proportion, I'll be able to kind of see that it's related uh, to D. Um, so I think that's the easiest way to kind of explain that problem. I think it's a little tricky, um, but uh, ask your follow-up questions there, Alyssa, if you have them. Let's keep going um, and, and take a look at 17 and 18 in packet number two. Um, all right. 17 says an object weighs four newtons and it swings on the end of a string as a simple pendulum at the bottom of the swing, the tension is six newtons. What is the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration of the object at the bottom of the swing? Um, so I think it, it's helpful to draw a free body diagram. Here's the pendulum bob at the bottom. Uh, we know that the earth is pulling down with four and we know that the string tension is six. X. Um, so I'm going to write this as tension and this is equal to weight. So the leftover force, if I call upwards uh, positive because anything radially inward is should be positive in a circular motion question, my, my dynamics equation becomes tension minus my weight is equal to my leftover force, which we call a centripetal force. And we know that centripetal forces are equal to mass times centripetal accelerations. So I basically get six minus four is equal to my mass, which uh, they, they didn't give us the mass, but they did indirectly. They gave us the weight, uh, four Newtons. Um, so, so I can calculate uh, you know, my mass by using W is equal to mg. So I can say four Newtons is equal to m uh, times g, which is 10. So m is gonna be 0.4 uh, kilograms. And so therefore, and, and the reason I, I usually would replace uh, centripetal acceleration with V squared over R, but in this question, they're asking me for it. Um, and so I get two over 0.4 is equal to my centripetal acceleration. Um, and I'm gonna get um, two over 0.4 um, uh, is, you know, uh, is gonna be roughly, around 4.9, uh, which is about half a G. And uh, that's, that's, where, that, that's where B uh, kind of comes into play. Um, so hopefully that answers your question for number 17. If you have follow-up questions on it, let me know. Number 18 says, um, you know, carnival riders um, do this carnival ride with their backs against a wall. Um, this is the, uh, the ride called Turkish Twist at Canopy Lake Park. Uh, here's the cylinder that I'm going to kind of try to try to draw, and uh, here's the person. I forget which one of the sections it was, but we we were able to take a look at this problem. So uh, here's the person wearing a baseball cap. Okay. So what are the forces acting on uh, the person? Well, um, there's a radially inward force. We'll come back to that in a second. We know that the Earth pulls down. That's mg. Um, there's an upwards force. Um, the radially inwards force is the normal force. It's the wall pushing the person in. I mean, if we snapped our fingers and the wall disappeared, they'd, they'd go in a straight line and they'd stop spinning around in a circle. The upwards force is the frictional force. And, and once they get you spinning, that's why the floor comes out of this thing. And if the frictional force is equal to your weight, then you don't slide down. And that's kind of part of the thrill of the ride. Um, is that experience of the floor coming out. So the question is, what's the minimum coefficient of static friction? All right, so we can set up a dynamics equation um, in the X direction. We'll say that the normal force, which is radially inward, is the only force, and therefore we'll call it our centripetal force. And uh, the centripetal force is equal to MV squared over R. Well, uh, we can figure out the speed 
from its rotational rate, right? That we would call that its spin rate, or more formally, its angular speed or angular velocity, if we knew its direction. It's 45 revolutions per minute. It tells you how fast it's spinning. By the way, um, terms like angular speed and angular velocity are formally part of the course in unit five. So um, we're, we can figure this out. It's not, it's not that bad. We've, we've done it a few times in class, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, in the y direction, if this is the x direction, in the y direction, it's friction minus the weight mg is equal to zero. And uh, our evidence for the, the fact that it's equal to zero is that it's not accelerated, right? The, the floor comes out and you just sit there in the y direction. You're accelerated in the x direction because you're moving in a circle, but in the y direction, you're not. So we can say that friction is equal to the weight vector mg. And, and uh, additionally, friction can be broken down into um, mu times the normal force uh, is equal to mg. Now, most of the time we replace fg uh, I'm sorry, we replace the normal force, this this part of the friction equation, with mg, but but in this case, that's not true. Uh, the normal force is definitely not equal to mg. It's not even in the same direction. It's perpendicular to the direction of the uh, normal force, right? So, so um, I got to figure out what I'm going to use for fn, and that's where this comes into play. So I know what, what m is. We, um, you know, in this problem eventually we'll see that it ultimately cancels out um and i'm solving it for mu let's go ahead and make that substitution this becomes mu times mv squared over r is equal to mg and if we do that then we can see the the mass of the rider cancels out and i made this kind of joke about uh and i often make the same joke about things moving in circular motion like, or in a vertical circle wouldn't it be weird if you know people of different mass fell out uh, so lighter people didn't and heavier people fell out. Well, you know, that would be weird. And that's the same thing here. Wouldn't it be weird if heavier people slid to the bottom? That'd be kind of embarrassing. I'd be afraid to get on the ride in that I'd be stuck on the bottom. Um, and what would that say? So clearly, uh, you know, um, the, the mass cancels out. And I can solve this for, for, for mu by multiplying both sides by r dividing by v squared. So mu is equal to gr over v squared. Well, g is a constant, it's 10. r was given to me as eight meters. All I need to know is, you know, what the speed is and plug that in and I'm, and I'm good to go. So let's go ahead and set that up. I, you know, uh, don't have a calculator here, but if I were to set this up with some train tracks, uh, the key is this next step right here. One revolution around the circle is two pi R, which in this case is eight meters, right? So that's the circumference of the circle is one revolution. In this case, the revolutions cancels out and I'm now left with meters per minute. I'm not done, right? Because I've got to convert the minutes into seconds. And so the minutes now cancel out. And so I multiply 45 times two times pi times eight divided by 60. And I have my answer in units of meters divided by seconds. So there's our angular speed to linear speed uh, conversion uh, with the train tracks here. We plug that in and we're good to go. Allie, make sure that I've answered your question about uh, 17 and 18. Let's take a look at what other questions are out there. Um, 11 and 2, and then I think we'll probably wrap up. So um, let's take a, a look at 11 and to on FR and review packet number two. Ooh, I can see 11. This one's nasty. Um, uh, let's take a look at number two and then we'll finish with that gross one. Um, balls tossed straight up uh, from uh, a small spherical asteroid. Now, if I was on Earth, um, let me draw a quick sketch of the Earth here. So if this is the Earth, the radius of the Earth is 6,400 kilometers. Dude, it's huge, right? So if you're gonna toss a ball straight up from the surface of the Earth, you're not throwing it even one kilometer. So, so the distance, the effective distance from the, between the center of mass of the ball and the center of mass of the Earth 
is never going to really change by much. So, you know, even if you could throw it a kilometer into the air, which is pretty high, uh, you're changing by just a fraction of 1%. And so the, 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 the force of gravity at its apex or at its, you know, the top of its path is going to be pretty much the same. It's going to be, you know, really, really close. Let's remember here that the force of gravity is equal to the constant g times the mass of the planet times the mass of the ball, which isn't changing, times their separating distance squared. So this is changing like a tiny, tiny little bit. So the force of gravity and the resulting, you know, acceleration of the ball uh, when it's at its, at, the, at its max height is pretty much the same. Yet technically it does change, but not much. Um, you know, if I were to graph that, by the way, uh, if I were to graph the force of gravity versus distance away from the center, technically speaking, you know, it does go down, but unless R gets really, really big, let's, let's take a look at this and let's make this R and let's make this 2R. Well, if the force is F at R, at 2R, it's going to be one fourth of that, right? This is the inverse square law. Uh, let's take a look at, you know, FG being proportional to one over the separating distance squared. I can call that one over D squared or one over R squared. That means it's going to be one fourth of its value. That means over these large, large distances, this thing changes a lot. Over tiny distances, you know, let's say from here to here, it hardly changes at all. So uh, let's take a look at the asteroid then. Well, you know, on an asteroid, if it's really, really small, then and you chucked a ball a kilometer up, that might be more than the radius of the asteroid. So they say you're on a small asteroid, the ball rises to a height equal to the asteroid's radius. So it started and the ball was at the surface of the asteroid with you a distance r away. So we know that fg is proportional to uh, one over r squared. And then we threw it up into the air and it went another r away. Now it's two r from the center of the asteroid. So in case one, we could say, all right, well, the force of gravity is one over one squared. In case two, uh, the force of gravity is one over two squared. Uh, so it's going to be one fourth its original value. If its original value uh, was one, one over one, then now it's one fourth. And so we can see that, um, you know, question number two, uh, a decreasing gravitational force, uh, it still acts downward, but it's getting smaller. Um, and the next question, number three, which you didn't ask about, uh, but we can see that it's one fourth. Uh, the acceleration at the surface, and and that's how we get that. That's how we get that answer. The force of gravity is one fourth, and so is the acceleration, right? So um, uh, I I could say that F G uh, is equal to weight, uh, which is equal to M G. So if I reduce uh, the force of gravity, then the uh, by a by a factor of uh, four, it's one fourth what it originally was. Then the resulting acceleration, assuming the mass doesn't change then the resulting acceleration also goes down by a factor of four. Hey, another way of looking at that same statement would be to write it in terms of Newton's second law. F net is equal to MA, right? That's just a different version of weight is equal to MG. So we just say, hey, you know, if the force, the net force at the top goes down by a factor of four and the mass doesn't change, well, then the acceleration also has to go down by a factor of four. So that's that's question number three. Uh, make sure, uh, uh, Connor, that I've answered your question. Um, and let's take a look at question number 11, which brings up this nasty word of frequency. Um, for starters, I think one of the reasons that um, uh, well, well, one of the reasons that this problem should be harder is because the word frequency hasn't formally been used in our class yet. So some people might might have had to look that up or just been confused as to what frequency was. 
we're going to formally study it in, uh, study it in um, unit six, which is oscillations, waves, and sound. Uh, frequency and period are related to each other. They're uh, inversely related. So uh, frequency is one over period, and then algebraically I could rearrange this and make it period is equal to one over frequency. So they're inversely related. Um, the units of frequency, by the way, are hertz, spelled capital H, E R T Z, uh, just like the car rental company. Um, the um, abbreviation is capital H lowercase z, and that's equal to uh, uh, you know the number of times something happens per second. Uh, so anyway, um, this question says the centripetal force of five newtons is acting on this object. Happens to be a rubber stopper moving at a constant speed in a horizontal circle. If the same force is applied, but the radius is made smaller. Let's go ahead and write this out. So we have a centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r. So we know that the mass doesn't change uh, in this problem. It's still the rubber stopper. And they say if the same force is applied, so the centripetal force, the value on the left-hand side doesn't change. That means the value of this fraction can't change either. So so it says, if the same force is applied, but the radius is made smaller, if we make the denominator smaller, then the, the numerator also has to get smaller because the value of this whole fraction isn't changing. So if that's the case, it gets got to get smaller. The numerator has to get smaller by the same amount. So V has to decrease. So by process of elimination, that gets rid of A and C and E. V decreases. And it's a 50-50 question at this point. Now, I, I understand that that's not good enough. Um, but if you were, you know, most of these problems, this is a great kind of learning opportunity. Most of these problems do reduce to some sort of a 50-50 problem. Um, and so this one does. Now, that's there's the speed question. So we know it's either B or D. We just have to figure out what happens to frequency. Um, well, because we said that these uh, two things, frequency and period, are inversely related. Why is it doing this? I'm not. All right. Uh, because it said, because we know that period and frequency are inversely related, why don't we see what happens to period? And then we'll be able to kind of use this relationship. By the way, uh, this in blue is on your equation sheet. So if you forgot it, you can find it there. So let's see what happens to this. Um, FC is equal to mv squared over r. And as we said earlier in this session, anytime we're talking about time or period, there's going to be a substitution where v is equal to uh, 2 pi r over period. So I'm going to substitute that in here. This becomes m times uh, 4 pi squared r squared uh, over period squared r, right? Th this r remains there. I just have to square everything over here, and that includes the denominator. Okay, so uh, I have r squared over r, so one of the two r's in the numerator uh, cancels out with the r in the denominator, and I'm going to solve this for a period, so it becomes period squared is equal to m times 4 pi squared over the centripetal force. I forgot an r somewhere, didn't I? I did. I forgot that r. All right, and then I'm going to have to take the square root of this. So now I just get period is equal to the square root of m times 4 pi squared r over the centripetal force. So they told us in this problem that the centripetal force isn't changing. 4 and pi are just numbers. They're not changing. The mass is also not changing. So what would happen if the radius decreased? If the radius decreased, that's in the numerator, then the period has to decrease. If the period decreases, the frequency is going to do the opposite. Frequency is equal to 1 over the period, right? So we just kind of algebraic, we solve that for frequency. So if the period is getting smaller, the, the denominator on this fraction for frequency is decreasing, right? Right up here, that gets smaller. And that means the value of the frequency goes up. And answer number D is our best answer. But, uh, but that's a you know, tough question. And I can see where there's confusion. 
uh, especially earlier on in the course when um, the concept of frequency hadn't formally been discussed. Are there questions that you might have that were follow-ups to ones that we've asked? Um, that's about um, an hour. I think that's good. There's about, uh, just so you know, there's 18 multiple choice questions uh, worth two points each. Um, and then there's one, only one FRQ. And so, so the multiple choice question is a bit shorter than you're used to. And the part two FRQs is kind of a lot shorter than you're used to. And the strategy there was um, so that uh, there'd be some time at the end of class for us to continue our forward progress on um, conservation of mechanical energy. Okay, um, that's it for tonight. I'm going to um, kind of stop the recording and then um, it takes maybe about an hour to compress and uh, I'll have it uploaded and posted um, later tonight. Okay, um, see you guys tomorrow and um, drive uh, safe if it's still kind of snowing a little bit out. The roads might not be clear perfectly by tomorrow morning, but we'll be good. All right, good night.